Okay, hello everybody, and thank you for being here today. So we are going to have a little bit of a conversation about uh, what it means to be a data scientist in a world where nobody knows what a data scientist is. So if you go on Google and you look for something like a data science pipe flow or machine learning pipeline or things like that, you're going to get basically one million images that look like this, or something like this. Most of the time, it's an iteration of uh, get some data, perform some modeling, clean the data, present results, and it sounds like this is all that there is to it. Sometimes they're going to add uh, something like go talk to the business, and uh, it sounds like it's just another step in the data science uh, pipeline. You know, you just go talk to the business, then they're gonna, you're going to get the data, and then you're going to be good to go. However, the problem is that uh, this go talk to the business, sometimes it's the biggest part of the job. So your modeling part, your data cleaning part, everybody knows how to do that. But you're going to have to deal with the human part. And unlike machine learning models, humans are a little bit more difficult to understand and sometimes more difficult to um, read in. So this is why we want to talk today about uh, what it means to meet those people, how you need as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer or even a manager that deals with those things, how you need to um, manage their expectations, how you need to speak up whenever they post something unrealistic. So it's not about them tell, coming to tell you do this or do that. You have to be able to tell them, no, we cannot do this. And it's also about educating about what uh, machine learning and data scientists really is and what are its capabilities. Okay, let's do the introductions. Uh, my name is Victoria. I am a data scientist at the DSB Digital Labs in Denmark, Copenhagen. I somehow managed to get two master's degrees into different fields, so Amy. And uh, whenever I'm not uh, doing my data scientist job, I'm a pretty avid baker, and I'm also a pretty good fencer. So if you have to say something bad about my baking, I'm going to fight you. Um, the DSB Digital Labs is the, basically the Area 51 of trains in Denmark. We are an uh, independent lab, semi-independent lab that's trying to transform the way that we use trains, transform the way that we uh, move from point A to point B, and along the way also share our findings and collaborate with other people and see how they are um, doing their thing, sometimes like not even related to movement. Anywho, on with it. So the major, major problem that we're facing as professionals in this field is that everybody and their grandma, they want to have some data science in their company. Like, doesn't matter if they know what it is or not. They want to have it. They want it to be there. They, want, they however, don't know what they want. Because there's so much hype around it, we hear every day if you open the newspapers, it's something about job automation, self-driving cars, predicting everything. And they come to you with uh, a bunch of things that are pretty unrealistic, pretty common, you see an iteration of one of those four things. One could be that they come to you with tons and tons and tons of data. So the company that they work in is probably already close to two centuries old. So you can imagine what's there. I mean, of course, computation is fairly recent, but two centuries sounds awesome. However, when you have that much amount of data, you don't know if that data is actually any good. And if you think about it, some of it has been collected for decades whenever it's another company. And it all has started in an era when um, data science wasn't a thing. Yeah, there were statistics, there were um, analysis, numbers, but still that was not the primary concern. So very often that data would be useless. Of course, people don't know this because they think, yeah, there's a lot of data, we can do something about it. And even though they have those tons of data, sometimes they have nothing. Another misconception is that what we're doing is intelligent. So they expect the thing to be smart, the thing to make decisions, the thing to be able to solve problems. In the end, you're just matching whether this is a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog. So it's pretty stupid. But most people don't know that. Most people that will come to you with a problem don't understand it. 
And kind of related to this, since they expect it to be intelligent, they would expect that it's going to do their job, that it's going to solve every single problem that they have without realizing that a lot of their job actually relies on the human element, on the human decisions. And we actually had a very interesting uh, case very recently where we're doing some kind, some little bit of uh, invoice automation. And it was a pretty big insight for the, our accountants that uh, we cannot just magically guess what they want in a certain field, because that field was based on the accountant making a phone call, having a conversation, making a decision based on that conversation. And most machine learning algorithms, despite what Google is trying to tell you, are not that good at phone calls yet. Finally, when we have a model in production, when we have predictions, when we have uh, some kind of a classification, what we really have is probabilities, and people don't deal well with probabilities. People don't like uncertainties. So whenever you make a prediction out there, put something with, say, 80% of probability, yeah, that's good, but whenever you're working there and clicking, and uh, you're, say, a marketing consultant or whatever, every once in a while, the algorithm is going to fail. You're going to get a different outcome from what it said. And over time, you're going to not trust it because you run on those so many examples that go against what your algorithm predicted, even though it's perfectly normal. So again, here it comes important. Uh, here comes the important part of managing those things, of teaching people to understand uncertainty. So what would happen is that you're going to usually be approached Depending on what you do, you can be approached by a client, you can be approached by a department to do something for them. Uh, if you're a startup, you, you will approach a company and uh, propose, like, we can do this, just give us the data. Or even just your grandparents that want to um, do some analytics on their website where your grandma is selling quilts. Those people would like you to do some kind of analysis, some kind of automation task, and uh, those people, how, how do we do, how do we manage this? How do we build this into a successful project? And it's a very, at least the way that we do it in the digital labs, it's a very simple thing. Um, it actually involves a lot of work, but still it's simple. Um, you set up a meeting with them, then you do some detective work, then you wrap up and um, then you give them the decision whether we want to take this into some kind of a project, some kind of an MVP, or we want to just kill the thingy. The most important part of this thing is the initial meeting. So this meeting is where you determine what exactly, precisely they want. They, they, they can tell you, we want to predict sales, but what does it mean? What product, what, uh, what time frame, what does your data look like? Uh, what do you expect? What, what are you going to do this, with this? So basically, you want to, ex to understand how their life is and how their life is going to look like when this product is out there. Because this is going to allow you to already start thinking about um, possible solutions, possible algorithms, possible things that you can do. And very often, this would mean that it's not even a machine learning algorithm or it's not even data science. Again, if we go back to, the, to this invoice example that I mentioned, um, our department, they want us to automate the filling out of, say, 10 or 15 columns of invoice information. And all of this is based on about five other columns. So you have 10, 15 um, variables that you need to predict based on five features. So. Yeah, but the thing is that all of those columns are actually based on very strict rules, so you, you can basically just write a complicated if and else statement and you have a perfect product out there. So it's always good to think how is the best way to solve it and can we do it without the data science. The next part that you need to do here is to establish the expectations. So again, what does success look like? Um, they might expect that you're going to, again, make all the decisions for them, but that's, that, that's not going to work. So you need to tell them, how is this going to look like here? You need to tell them what are the low-hanging fruits, so what you can do first, and uh, 
how this is going to look like for them, whether what you can do for them is actually going to be good enough. So, for example, you might be able to automate one column, you might be able to uh, predict something that has uh, nothing to do with what they actually want, but it's a good proxy. Again, um, one of my best examples here is uh, we are trying to predict in Denmark uh, the number of passengers that go on trains. So, we have people that every once in a while go on the trains and then they count people, they count them manually, so that's a horrible system, but it's a start. Based on this count, however, you can get a pretty good proxy of how many tickets you're going to sell. Even though this count includes commuters, it includes people with commuter cards and so on, um, this is still a valuable proxy that can be used for something else that they're going to use. So they initially come to us and tell us, we want to predict our sales, but sales data actually is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more difficult to get. And they want to tell you, we want to predict how many, pass how many tickets are we going to sell on the train from Copenhagen to Aarhus. So we go into the historical data, we look into how many passengers were there, we make an estimation based on that, we apply some maths, and that's a compromise, but it could be a very useful compromise. Based on this initial meeting, you already have a couple of clues and you know what uh, needs to be done next. Uh, you need to go and look at what the data looks like. Because you should never, never, never go into a project before having access to the data and having seen what it looks like. Uh, you need to find where does it live. You need to find is it this all the data. You need to find who owns it. And you need to find uh, what bad practices are there. Because very often, um, the people that come to you, they don't understand that they're interacting to, with the data through an interface. For example, SAP or something like that. The data might live in the warehouse in SQL servers, but people don't know that. And the data might be a view, an aggregate, missing features, cleaned up, you name it. So it when we do our work, however, we want to have the purest form of the data. Another thing is that when you go there, the people who are inserting the data, practices change, some things are dropped, there are mistakes, there are empty values that uh, put a pretty big wrench in our algorithms. So we, we need to know what these are, we need to know how this thing works. Who owns the data is also very important because those people are going to give you access and if you're in a big behemoth of a company, that can take forever. We've had cases where um, we wanted to get some maintenance data and it took us something like six months until we get access to that. And uh, I have a friend of mine who works into another company, so it does with uh, prediction of milk and cheese and things like that. They had to wait more than a year until they got what they needed. So you need to identify who the owner of this data is and who, and uh, how to pressure them into giving you what they want. But that's not all, because uh, that's more of the data part. You also need to do a lot of detective work. So sometimes you're going to need to corner someone, put the light in them, and very, 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 very carefully question them what exactly is that they do throughout the day, because through understanding this process, you will understand how the decisions are made. And if you do not understand this process, if you don't understand what they do throughout the day, you will not be able to automate that part. You will not be able to build something that's useful for them and that makes reliable approximation of their, pro of their process. Here it's very important to know the quirks, the compromises and their faults. So sometimes people make decisions uh, on a whim. They decide, yeah, that's not exactly like that, so let's put this number here. We need to know what that is. You need to know what, what they're doing there what their decisions are and who makes them. Again, here it's very important to see how much of those decisions are actually based on stuff that's in the data and how much is based on the humans. Part of this detective work, so you need to question them. So when you sit them down, like, like you're questioning a child, like you're questioning your five-year-old cousin. So when you do this, how do you do this? This one here, who told you to put that there? Why do you put it there? Sometimes you might have to go through many, many people because uh, Someone enters the data, say an invoice, and saves it. Then a couple of days later, someone else needs to go through that thing and change sometimes. Boom, everything goes to hell with all your predictions because 
the data is not stable. Only then, only after you have all of that stuff, um, you can do some data analysis. So ask for a sample data set, ask for, ask for something small and make a small report, make some small concept, but don't go too much into it. Don't dive too deep into it. You just want to see, yeah, this potentially can be done or this cannot be done. And you know how it's done, like check one of the other talks or something like that. So I'm not going to bother you with that problem. Once you've been through those three steps, so you've identified where the data lives, how bad it is, and uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of how, how it is used, and what you can do. You can bring all that together. You can bring your clients over. You can have a good meeting with them and tell them, we found this and this. We can do this and this for you. And here it's very important to really, really make clear what the downsides of your proposal are. Again, if we go back to the thing that I mentioned earlier, Probabilities, for example, people don't understand probabilities in general. Or you need to explain to them that uh, you may not be able to do the full process. Will they be happy if you fill out, say, one of those five columns, if you predict uh, one of those six numbers that they have? And here it's very, very important again to make everything very clear to everyone so that it's Again, think like you're writing for your five-year-old cousin. If they cannot understand, you can even do it. Take your report, take your kids, for example, sit them down, read them, and if they cannot understand, go back and rewrite that shit. Because we live in our own myopia, we live in our own data science world, and sometimes things that we think are understandable and are easy, they're not going to be that easy to understand from for Karen from accounting. Like, she doesn't know those things, and we need to make it accessible. If we want to be successful, or if we want to make her and everybody else make good decisions, because if they don't make a good decision, if uh, this means that we're going to be stuck on a dead-end project, and when it fails, they're going to point the fingers at us because we failed to do our jobs, even though it was an impossible project. So we need to make those things very, very clear. And we need to make a proposal based on those, of course, this wrap-up meeting, those reports that you made, that we make. Um, we need to also tell them, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And here it's also very important. So the most important thing is to be assertive. So a lot of, I'm going to rely, rely on a stereotype here. A lot of data scientists tend to be nerds and, and uh, a little bit introverted and so on. And then you have managers and people big in the hierarchy coming on to you and using all their authority. You have to push back. You have to be able to speak up. You have to be able to tell them, no, this is not going to work. And of course, you need to use language that they're going to understand. So whenever possible, use numbers in terms of money. Use uh, words that tell them what they're going to gain and what they're going to lose in terms of what they know and what they use. In the end, give them a good idea. We can do this or we cannot do this. If you choose to do this, go for the minimum viable product, if you're familiar with the term, I suppose you are. The minimum thing that you can do in a certain amount of time as a start. Give them a roadmap and uh, how, that how that looks and what goes into there and basically structuring your project. Now, that's another talk which I'm not going to touch on today. I think that covers Oh, so I guess um, I can answer some questions, which I hope is going to bring some more clarity on this topic.